And welcome to Let Him Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo. And I'm Miss Joan Marie Moussi. And we have a real live human rights, international human rights activist with us, someone who has been down to the fighting and seen what's going on in Oaxaca in Mexico. Simon, welcome to Let Them Talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, Glad thank to you have for you coming. here. And uh, of course, we're live show as usual, and uh, you can call and ask questions at 212 757 1538. We'll be happy to take your calls later in the show. Oh, yeah, call us up. In the meantime, uh, let's jump right to it. Oaxaca, we're here. We've been playing material. We've had interviews and playing material at dem uh, videotape demonstrations for several weeks now. Uh, October 27th, a tragic day for us here in New York. Of course, this has been going on in Oaxaca long before that. Brad Will, our friend, was uh, shot to death while filming as a journalist in Oaxaca. Uh, activities by the police down there and the government authorities of the state of Oaxaca. Now we have the federales, the federal police. It's There's more uh, alphabet soup police organizations flying in from every different direction than I've seen in a long time. Uh, what's going on in the in Oaxaca? Where is it? What's it like? What is Oaxaca and what's going on there? Well, Oaxaca is the second southernmost state in the nation of Mexico, abutting right next to Chiapas, where most everybody is aware of the Zapatista uprising that's been going up since 1994. Um, Oaxaca is very much like Chiapas, full of indigenous people. As a matter of fact, it has more indigenous tribes than Chiapas does, and 70% of these indigenous people do not even speak Spanish as their primary language. So it's, the concentration of indigenous there is quite higher. Um, basically what is going on in Oaxaca is what's going on all over this world today, and it's an imposition of a political economy to the point that it's gotten quite violent. Um, what's happening is that the imposition of what we call a neoliberal political economy has commodified natural and human resources to the point of turning them into mere variables in an equation for profit and more and more the human variable in that equation is considered a disposable variable just for not being necessarily economically viable or trainable or able to plug into the economic model. Now what's happening in Oaxaca as is happening in Chiapas and Guerrero and Veracruz and Michoacan and other states throughout the nation of Mexico and throughout the global south in its entirety is that people have begun to organize and resist the imposition of this political economy. And with this resistance comes a more serious form of brute force, which comes in the form of militarization, the militarization of the police, and then the phenomenon that eventually got Brad Will in more trouble, in serious trouble, and got a lot of people killed and has got a lot of people disappeared in Oaxaca, which is paramilitarism, which is the militarization of civilians, which has been going on in Central and South America and in Mexico for quite some time. Now, who would a paramilitary be working for? Well, in most cases, paramilitaries are trained, financed, and armed by the military, the police, through help of the government. But in many cases, it varies. Sometimes it's local land barons that are arming and controlling local pistoleros or gunslingers that are also paramilitaries. In Mexico, we have the phenomenon being so entrenched that even at the university level, there are what we call urban paramilitaries, or the word in Mexico for them is porros or porrismo is the phenomenon of urban paramilitarism, where university-age students are trained and financed to either attack activist students or to provoke violence and destabilize situations. These porros, or urban paramilitaries, later grow up and graduate to be governors or leaders of what are known as white guards or death squads, which are more organized paramilitary groups. Wow. There's a lot going on there. It seems like people here in the United States and North America sort of go on in total ignorance, really, of what's happening just a few miles south of their common border with this other country that they don't even really fully seem to understand exists. Absolutely. From my perspective, it seems that Americans aren't very much aware of what's going on even in their own backyards. The phenomenon of devaluing communities of color and displacing them for ec towards economic ends is happening in our own city in the form of gentrification throughout the city. 
Gentrification is not just the raising of property taxes, which eventually displaces people on a low intensity level, but gentrification also includes the influx of narcotics into our com communities. It also includes the increase in police brutality in our communities. It also includes the decrease in employment in our communities, right? So these political and economic forces that the people in Oaxaca are facing really are things that people in communities of color here in our own country are facing on a regular basis. But it does very much so seem like the U.S. general population is inundated in a whirlpool of propaganda and lies and is not very much aware of these forces. Well, go ahead, John. Oh, excuse me. Um, well, we went to a demonstration last night at the Mexican consulate, and a few people were holding signs that said um, that the U.S. had some control over the Mexican government, that the U.S. government had some kind of um, influence or strong influence over the Mexican government. Do you think that that's true? I think it's absolutely true. Right now we are aware of, and you can get the information at SOAW.org, which is the School of America's Watch organization, an organization that has been protesting a military base here in Fort Benning, Georgia for the last 25 years for doing just that, training Latin American militaries. And like I was saying, what we have is a list of over 1,700 Mexican military personnel that have been trained at the School of Americas, right? We have their names, their ranks, and when they were trained and what they were trained in. Right now, we're in the process of trying to figure out which, if any, of these military officials were actually directly responsible for heading the operations going on in Oaxaca and Antenco right now. The chances of that are pretty high because the types of strategies that are being employed are strategies that this country has developed over a long period of time and have been being employed in places like El Salvador, Guatemala, et cetera, et cetera. Today, this year, the New York Times Magazine published an article talking about the El Salvadorization of Iraq, which is basically the training and equipment of commando death squads in Iraq in order to create further deniable atrocities that the United States government is imposing on the, on the people of Iraq. Let's take a let's go back and look at a little of the history of the specific struggle that's been happening in Oaxaca. Now that we have some grounding as to what's happening, what? Now let's start with the teacher strike in May. But obviously, it didn't that didn't grow out of the ground. There was something going on in Oaxaca for a long time, and the teacher strike was the most recent manifestation. What was the purpose of that teacher strike? What was its goals, and how did it start the events that led to what we see right now going on? Okay. Well, the teacher strike is a is a particular phenomenon. It's an independent teachers union called Section 22, which in, Spanish, in English is Section 22. Now, this independent teachers movement has gone on strike pretty much every year for the last several years in Oaxaca City. The last more recent re years, it's gotten more and more intense, making more serious demands. The original demands of the teachers strike, which began on May 22nd, as you said, um, was were basically better teaching conditions, better education conditions, and better wages for teachers, right? Every year they go on strike demanding these things. Teachers in our societies all across the world, in particular in capitalist and imperialistic authoritarian societies, teachers are greatly devalued, yet teachers are the ones who teach the professionals that make the most money in our societies, right? Mm -hmm. I ask my youth that I work with in the community in Bronx, who makes more money, a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor? And they say, obviously, a lawyer, a doctor. But who teaches a lawyer or a doctor, right? right. So it's this is why teachers are an integral component to the resistance because they are in communities and are given the choice whether to teach lies or teach truth to the people in order to liberate them from the from from this tyrannical society. They so also know everybody. They also know everybody. Exactly. <laughs> Just on a practical level. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. So so they have this strike and 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 it's its own thing, but simultaneously with the repression and the history of repression against organized teachers and organized communities in Oaxaca, when the repression hit on June 14th, then it was obvious that the rest of the state was going to fall in What soon. happened on June 14th? On June 14th, the state uh, preventative state police, this is not federal police, the state preventative police, which is very unique to Oaxaca and the governor of Oaxaca having militarized state troopers, uh, went into the city and tried to lift up the permanent sit-in that had been placed by the, by the Section 20 of those teachers. Now, this was a violent attack against the teachers in sitting the center of town. in the center of town, but by the middle of the afternoon, the teachers had reclaimed the territory and the police had fallen back. Um, then the standoff, or the, the holding of the center of Oaxaca City lasted for an additional three months and was joined by forces of what is now known on, on, since June 16th, the Asamblea Popular del Pueblo de Oaxaca, which is the Oaxacan People's Popular Assembly. 
Um, we call it APO. Right? Yes, yes, sir. Um, and they have a very interesting website. Mm -hmm. They have several, actual several different websites. And a radio um, station. And a radio station. Yeah, we've been hearing, everybody all over the world has been hearing Absolutely. streaming. It's really interesting on that point. The Zapatistas, when they rose up in 1994, the New York Times said that they were the first postmodern revolution because they had used the internet in order to have their message heard and get enough international and domestic attention to their issues where they wouldn't be annihilated mm -hmm. for, claiming, for their, claiming their demands. Yeah. In this case, in Apple, what is interesting is that we're learning something that I think is very important for people to pay attention to, is it was radio that saved the Apple, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, the technology was more appropriate, right. more accessible, and right now, more, you know, more yeah. prevalent, right? right. So it was easier to find, get a radio station up and going, and they get computers. And, and for guy, people to be able to hear and it. Right, the internet is a huge factor, yeah, in, and will right. always be in, in this, but the radio really has The has video helped. factor, without mentioning one specific site, we've been going to sites, and the people have been putting videos, whether it's New York or Oaxaca, from all over the world, actions, everybody can really see it happen. Absolutely, it's, it's very powerful. It's yeah, very powerful. I, mean, it's one of the most I think that's an, an integral component to all of this, is thinking about in independent media in places like this where people are getting the word out. While the BBC and Reuters and the AP and the New York Times and Fox News are all really continuing to spout out the lies that they would in a situation like this, there's a huge network of folks that are down there that are closely related to the situation and continue, continue to spread the word. This is Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo with Joan Moosey and our guest is Simone uh, from the South Bronx, an international human, human rights activist. Uh, and he is here to talk to us about what's happening in Oaxaca and the issues and the events that led up to the murder of our friend Brad Will from Indie Media here in New York. We've known him for many years, Joni and I both, in the housing struggles on the Lower East Side. And it was a very tragic and, and shocking night when we heard that he had been shot down while filming uh, the actions of the government police in the state of Oaxaca, where, as we've heard, we've been discussing with Simone the uh, political and uh, troubles that have been going on there. Speaking of, uh, by the way, our number is on the screen. We're live. We'll take your calls if you have questions for Simone and uh, try and uh, answer them as best as we can. Um, We'll give the number out because okay, we'd love to hear from you. Two one two seven five seven one five three eight is the number, and we'll be looking out. Just keep on ringing. We'll be looking out for you. Now I have a question for Simon too about um, how much time have you personally spent in Oaxaca? You're from New York, right? Uh, well, I'm living in New York now. Mm -hmm. I'm originally from New Mexico and had had been living in Texas for the last thirteen years. I oh, just moved to New York, and I'm doing community work out here. Um, but I've been going to Oaxaca on and off for the last six years and specifically documenting paramilitary activity there during that period of time. Let's talk about the guy who's behind this all, uh, the governor. Um, his name is Ruiz, right? Uh -huh. Ruiz is Ruiz Ortiz. And tell us a little bit about him. How did he come to power and why has he become such a controversial figure with, with Apo and the teachers and the community? Yeah, do they have elected officials? Is that... I th here's the situation, is that uh, Oaxaca has continued to be dominated by the PRI, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or Institutional Revolutionary Party, which is the party that held Mexico under its thumb for the last 70 years before Fox was elected, which really is no different economically and politically, however, somewhat of a change because the PRI was significantly more brutal. He says Ruiz is from that party and is from that same old regime as of the previous two governors or several governors before him. Regime change in terms of the PRI hasn't happened in Oaxaca yet. And the regime change on the federal level with the PAN hasn't had any significant effects in the state of Oaxaca whatsoever because it's the same group of barons that are stealing the land and, and, and basically raping the indigenous life. So, he says Reese, what is, I think, maybe a little bit particularly unique about him is that he's significantly more violent, he's significantly more aggressive, he's definitely into going back into his, the old ways of dominating space and dominating old indigenous school. communities, exactly. And he, um, basically, as he came into power, the first thing that he said was that he w would resolve Oaxaca's social situations within a couple weeks. And, and what he did was, it, it, his, his idea of resolving social situations was to begin to detain political activists oh, okay. and threaten them and blackmail them and make them sign agreements of non, of non what were called agreements of non-protest, that they, would, they wouldn't engage in protests uh -huh. in order to gain their liberation. Right. We're um, court order here. Exactly. <laughs> we're going to have an opportunity. I think we have a call. Yeah, let's give it a shot. You're on. Welcome to Let Them Talk. Hello? Go ahead. Hello. Yeah, you're on the air. 
Yes. Yeah. Oh, you got shy. <laughs> the last one. Hello? Hello? Are you there? I guess not. No. <laughs> Sorry about that. Try again. Um, okay, let's call it. That's interesting. This, because I just got an email just a few hours ago that a, a very good friend of yours had been, had, who had disappeared, was released. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I don't have the details of the situation, uh, other than a very good friend of mine was detained on in route to Oaxaca City to participate in solidarity actions. Uh, we really didn't expect him to get out at all because he has been a wanted individual for quite some time for engaging in political activity. Um, I'm not really sure exactly how it is that he got out, but at this point I don't really care because I was really quite... Because uh, it's good news. Yeah, it's yeah, good I'm just really quite annoyed that he, he was Now arrested. what's going on? And people are, you know, activists are disappearing by the dozens? Is that what's going on? That is. It's happening. We're well, hearing of up, to, up to five people a day are disappearing. Mm. I think obviously any sort of violence is is atrocious and 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 disgraceful and 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 nothing that we want to be dealing with however disappearances are significantly more violent in the psychological effects that it has on the communities on the families of these people when you don't at least have a body to claim right, you have no idea what so when happens. somebody disappears you always have that longing that hope that somebody may come back and what is traditional for lack of a better word, when governments engage in disappearances is then to engage in threatening campaigns with the families mm -hmm. and therefore is keep them from engaging in further political That's activity. Right. Frighten so, people, yeah. So I see. Now we have another phone yeah, call, and maybe fine. the lady's trying again. And you're on? Hi, can I place an order? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll serve up some... Uh, yeah, we're going to serve some, some, some action up here. Some dignity and some justice for you real quick. Sounds right. good, sounds that was good. That really good. Uh, let's take it to the uh, to the next level then, and uh, talk about what happened on October 27th. What's what happened on that day with Brad Will? Uh, were you in Oaxaca at the time, or were you in the United States? No, I was not in Oaxaca at the time. I was in the United States. Um, last mm -hmm. time I was in Oaxaca was in 2005. All right. To the best of your knowledge, what's what happened? That well, right. from what I'm able to see from the images and from what I understand from people's testimonies down there, Brad Will was filming an attack by plainclothes police officers who were acting as paramilitaries for the PRI party. This is a particular phenomenon in terms of paramilitarism. We call them halcones, which is hawks, which are plainclothes police officers act doing paramilitary activity, who were shooting at the barricade close to the Consejo Indígena Popular de Oaxaca House, Sipo House. And uh, Brad was near that barricade and began to film along with other photographers who began to take pictures. And from what we're able to see, these paramilitaries directly shot and killed Brad Will. Um, he was filming at the time, and I've seen the film. I'm glad we're here with three people who've seen the film to right. discuss it together because, uh, you know, who would believe it unless you saw it? And, you know, it's on the internet. And it is all over the internet, yeah. yeah. We've, uh, uh, we'd rather show the more uplifting pictures of people struggling and demonstrating and have uh, shied away from showing that film on this, uh, this program, but people can see it on the internet. Um, it's a tragic sight. Uh, what happened? Why couldn't they get help to Brad? Um, well, the city was had been shut down. It had been in, it had been shut down, and obviously the police aren't trying to help the people. Mm -hmm. Right? The Red Cross and different doctors have joined uh, the Apple struggle and are there present, you know, and are there for a while. The situation with an American citizen being shot, I think, is particular. Um, I would say that it was intentional to make the help not not arrive in time. That that wouldn't surprise me one bit. I can't say for sure, but that wouldn't. But surprise there didn't me seem to be an ambulance available. No, there or... wasn't. They actually had to transport him in a in a Volkswagen Bug. And do they know who did it? Do they arrest the perpetrators? The, the perpetrators murders? were supposedly detained briefly, but are definitely no longer detained. As a matter of fact, we have information to the fact that they've engaged in further paramilitary attacks around who, the city. Who are they? Do we know who shot Brad, or do we know of the people who might be amongst those? Who there are pictures of the shooter as he's shooting and other individuals and with, with guns and their names. I don't have it on me right uh -huh. now, but, but yeah, it's online. Right, it's online. People can see their names. And these folks were actually picked up and then later released from jail. From what I understand. According to the stories. Now, after Brad shot, was shot and killed, then all hell broke loose in Oaxaca. I mean, what happened? The federal who are the federal, the federal police? How are they different? What did they do? How do they get there? What do they do when they got there? Well, there's no way to tell for sure, but my, from my whatever uh, layman's opinion, right, of the situation, 
uh, it's, it seems relatively obvious that with the murder of an American journalist, that the federal government was going to have to step in and do something. Mm -hmm. And there was a State Department um, communique that demanded that something be done. You mean from the U.S. From the State US. Department? The U.S. Okay. State Department demanded that demanded something order be... Basically gave the go-ahead, yeah. you know, by saying, yo, you need, you need to fix that That's amazing that, uh, that, that the U.S. State Department gave the order and the Mexican government, we were earlier talking about what's the role right. of the, the U.S. government in this. This yeah. is an interesting yeah, it version is an of it. Well, I mean, really, to take a step backwards, I wouldn't rule out any possible theory of the fact that maybe the U.S. government gave the order to shoot Brad Will. The fact of the matter is that as international human rights activists and independent journalists, one of the things that we do when we engage in these type of activities is take calculated risks, right? And one of the calculated risks that we take is being deported or perhaps beaten by the police. But as U.S. citizens, and Brad Will in particular, was a very tall, white American man. Right. It's you know, obvious. it's very obvious what you're doing when you're shooting this guy. And paramilitaries, especially Alcones, police, right, mm -hmm. acting as paramilitaries, aren't too keen on getting in the type of trouble that you can get into for right. shooting an American like this. Now, these guys didn't get in trouble. The U.S. government isn't demanding that they get in trouble. Right. We have pictures. We have footage. To me, it just kind of seems like fine, like like uh, some sort of like con tel tel pro thing where you know. Now, what do you think about young people who hear about what's happening in Oaxaca and want to help the people there? Do you recommend that they go there? Do you recommend that they uh, get educated before they go there? Find out a little bit about what's really going on. Do you recommend that they speak Spanish if they're planning to go there? What would be your advice to a young person who's just overwhelmed by all this information and dedicated to doing something? I think it's, first of all, very important to understand that there's a lot to be done here in terms of solidarity with the people of Oaxaca and in terms of it being and standing in solidarity with the people in our own country that are suffering the similar types of types of activity, maybe not quite as blatant, but in, in other, other degrees in our own communities. I think that's a priority. We can see from the footage that is all over um, the internet that the people in Oaxaca, just like the Zapatistas, are very well organized. Yeah. They don't need our help in order to organize themselves. What we need to do is help ourselves and organize ourselves here. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is here where this is going to be decided. It is here where the economic and political policies are being made and, and, and controlled and imposed on these people, right? Now, if somebody does decide that what they want to do is get to the level where they decide to go down and, and stand in solidarity with the people of Oaxaca, then it's very important to understand several things. One, that we don't take a paternalistic role where we think that we have the power to empower, right? I think people get a lot of confused, like, oh, I'm an American, so my role is to help people out. The reality is if we go down, the first and foremost thing is we're going to learn a lot more than than they are from right. us. Right. Now we do have, however, access to resources and technology and know-how that is very necessary down there. And if done properly and appropriately, then we can contribute to the self-empowerment of the people And be of a service to yeah. the people. Absolutely. What's happening as far as that kind of direct? Right now, I know we, we were at meetings at St. Mark's and different places where folks were talking about caravans, sending computers, things like that down. What, what are, what's the most, and that's interesting, why the choice of computers and cameras and media equipment? And how do you, what kind of organization takes the caravan? And of course, you don't have that much time. Yeah. So. Okay, so very quickly, uh, on the website, elenemigocomun.net, which is E L E N. Uh, sorry, E L E N I M G O C O M U N, right? That's the common enemy in Spanish, el enemigo comun.net. You can donate there for us to be able to get cameras and the media equipment as well as get donations to get medical equipment. Mm -hmm. It's not just media equipment, but also medical yes. equipment. Um, one of the things that we're doing is both supporting community organizations, media organizations on the ground in Oaxaca who are in dire need of, of cameras and, or, and editing equipment in order to further document the human rights atrocities and violations that are going on in the community, as well as document the histor historical significance of the resistance that is going and on. And that documentation is having an effect. Is that, that documentation is absolutely Because the federal effect. troops came in and there's been lots of fighting back and forth, but maybe the violence would have been worse if it wasn't that the media and cameras and all 
these things have been drawn into it. Maybe. To a certain degree, absolutely. I yeah. mean, yeah. Uh, it absolutely helps. However, what, what I was saying about contributing to the self-empowerment of the people is that right now, it's really, it's a tenuous situation because we could create very serious codependencies on the international community. And that's very dangerous, in my opinion, in this type of situation when people are fighting for their liberation. If we want to do this right, then we will contribute to their self-empowering and teach them how to use the cameras and use the equipment so they can do this for themselves. Like in any other situation, right. teach them how to fish, not just give them a fish. And that's right. what we at Elimino... You don't need John Reed. Fight. John Reed was 100 years ago. Now we want to have a million Mexican John Reeds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And John Reed, of course, is the famous author and socialist guy 100 years ago who went and traveled with Pancho Villa and informed America as to what was going on there. And he wrote a great book, one of the best books I've ever read on the revolution in Mexico, insurgent Mexico. But at the same time, he did represent, as much as I respect him, sort of the paternalistic American journalist, you know, saving everybody. Th those days are over. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those days are absolutely over. We, we can no longer create codependencies and it's on this for country everyone. for other people's yeah. liberation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so people should redouble their efforts to do social organizing here in the United States in support of the folks in Oaxaca and in general because there's so many people suffering here and we're talking in the South Bronx, we're coming to the end here, but just for a moment, you say your, your community center is facing eviction right now in the South Bronx? Well, I mean, I mean, in so to speak, we've got, we've been basically moved into a smaller space. Um, I'm not going to list any names or anything because I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but the community center I've been working in and the, the issues that we're facing in the South Bronx are very serious. Very quickly, the police brutality and the, and the influx of high-level real estate is gentrifying our community. Um, and that's what Brad Will was really, when I first met him, that's what he was all about. He was a very strong squatter. Uh, and we I'm working bought, on housing yeah, issues on the lower east side. Many, mm -hmm. and, and I'll never forget, we're coming to the end now, I'll never forget him coming out there on the roof of uh, Fifth Street Squat and stopping a demolition in progress. I mean, they were like, had the ball, the metal ball, and they were smashing against the walls. And he walks out on the roof and they had to stop everything. He was a very courageous man. Who Absolutely. Really, and Absolutely. He was a strong and powerful guy. Last 30 seconds. I, I think it's really important to recognize that what we're dealing here with, what we're dealing with, Sorry. I think it's very important to realize that what we're dealing with here is a very violent and racist system that is devaluing people of color throughout the world, throughout the global south. People are being eliminated. We're not making this isn't a joke. We're talking about genocide. And that's exactly what's going on. And if we here in this country don't do something to change this, we're going to have further genocide on our own land and throughout the world and a lot of very angry people with us, which we've already witnessed in the last several several months. Well, we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Simone. Thank you for uh, being for with information. us. Yeah. And yes, thank you, John.